Hey, I'm Rhiannon and this is Travel Talking, the Travel Talk podcast. Travel Talk is the app that helps you connect with fellow travellers wherever you are in the world. We are the voice of real travellers discovering the world one country at a time, with a few guests joining us and an entire planet to cover. Go your own way. Travel Talk, we're like Tinder for travel without the fucking. Search for Travel Talk on the App Store. That's Travel Talk without the E. Go your own way. Welcome back to Travel Talking. We have a very exciting episode ahead where we're going to hear from Mitchell Harris, who is going to talk us through the Call Me By Your Name trip he did in northern Italy as a result of the book and the film, which is quite well known these days. Mitch, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. No, I'm really excited to hear about your trip. Now, before we go into mm. the details, tell me, call me by your name. What? How did you discover that and what does that mean to you? Well, it's it's a, a fun story, really, in, in that the film was, it came out in 2017, I think, and the there were posters all over London, okay, for this film. And I just ignored them, completely ignored them. My friend Catherine said to me, oh, yeah. Should we go and see Call Me By Your Name? And I said, well, what's Call Me By Your Name? You know, <laughs> And so I looked it up and I watched the trailer. And if you haven't seen the trailer, you need to see the trailer because it's the most amazing sort of three minutes of, the, you know, it just encapsulates the feeling of the film and the book so perfectly. And I, I discovered the book very quickly. And so I read the book in like two weeks, in two weeks. And just the story of Elio, of Oliver, of Italy, the the way they sort of lived. It was set in the 80s. It's just a, this beautiful sort of dreamscape of everything I wanted to do that summer. So it sort of uh, it led really nicely into then seeing the film in October of that year and just completely falling in love with the story and somehow wanting to replicate that in some kind of dream world. It's such an easy story to fall in love with because yeah. the scenery, um, the, the book is set in Italy, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, somewhere in northern Italy. Somewhere in northern Italy. Well, the film, you know, the, the opening is somewhere in northern Italy. That's your starting point. But the book is somewhere sort of middle of Italy, sort of the Brito region. So it's slightly different. Yeah, either, you know, if you want to think about sort of going to Italy or being in the sort of midst of the, the Italian landscape, either the film or the book really give you that sort of encapsulation. It's lovely. And basically, that's what happened here, right? You yeah, exactly. were <laughs> These uh, visions within the film evoked a kind Completely. of interest as to see where they went. And you yeah. started to research, if I'm correct, yeah, totally. online. I mean, actually, it's interesting because after I'd seen the film, you know, I mean, actually, what's funny about the, having read the book, I, having seen the film trailer before reading the book, Elio and Oliver as the main characters were always... Timothy Chalamet and Almy Hammer. And so when I was reading the book, that was who I had in my head and the experiences they were having was them. So it was really easy to sort of imagine what they might have done in northern Italy. So then sort of planning out that sort of romance, as it were, sadly, um, I didn't manage to uh, repeat the romance exactly, <laughs> but it was all about planning that trip. And the some of my friends were happened to be going to Italy or were planning to go to Italy in the following summer So um, of the, of, after the film. Uh, and I thought to myself, wow, I'd love to go. Having read the book and having seen the film, I'd love to recreate part of that or just go to Italy and enjoy Italy, you know. But it just so happened that they were going to an area which was surrounded by film locations, essentially the, the mecca of Call Me By Your Name and amazing to sort of serendipity, you know, how that panned out. So how did you work out mm. that you were actually going to these, the same places that were in the film? Like what? Yeah. What allowed you to discover those places and link them back? So firstly, it was uh, my, uh, some friends said, oh, you know, this is where we're going to stay. At this sort of area, we're thinking of going here in northern Italy. And I thought, OK, so that's interesting. And they started sharing me, sharing some different links on Airbnb and things like that. And I thought, OK, great. And then I started looking at the film locations in parallel. And I found, you know, these articles of where Elio and Oliver had spent their time or in the film or really then started to paint a sort of picture, a map of where some of these places were. And then I came across this amazing, extensive PDF of completely just by fluke on the, in the middle of some forum in the, you know, the depths of the internet that someone had created, uh, which listed all of the places in the film, almost word for word, you know, from what Elio and Oliver were saying. or And this then allowed me to think, wow, okay. So I started clicking onto the locations. It went onto Google Maps or Apple. Uh, suddenly I realized that where we were going to stay was in the heart of 
where the film locations were. Wow, and you almost had a secret map suddenly yeah, telling exactly. you all the hotspots to go. Yeah. Okay, well, can you talk us through exactly where you went? Absolutely, um, absolutely. So we, uh, I mean, the, the, the first thing was to fly, of course, so you, to get to Italy. And so we arrived uh, in Milan, uh, in Milan, Bergamo. Didn't go off to Milan. Begins, right? Where it begins, exactly. And actually, this part of the trip is references the end of the film. So we land at the beginning, uh, which is the end of the film. So for the, for the trip, it was a sense of just going to this tiny little sort of town, which is on the sort of hillside, in, which is Bergamo, an amazing uh, hidden sort of old town and uh, so, so beautiful. And this is the part of the film where Elio and Oliver are dancing their night away uh, when they go on the trip to Bergamo, when they go off, um, they leave where they were staying in the film. And Elio is, of course, sick by, the, by this fountain. This fountain doesn't exist. It's, uh, it's near this beautiful uh, building in Bergamo, but it doesn't exist. But I found the exact spot. And it was amazing to, to see this uh, and to start the trip in this way. I just sudden, I felt like such a sort of call me by your name geek. Well, a uh, connection you know. <laughs> to something that you'd obviously yeah. felt quite inspired by. Yeah, absolutely. So you, I mean... Bergamo Milan, it sounds like mm. that is a central part of the movie at one point. Yeah. But actually, the hub of the movie, yeah. um, where they sort of spend the summer, is in a different place, right? Exactly. So you, very quickly, after we, we spent just an afternoon in Bergamo, and we got into my little, the tiny little smart car, critical vehicle, uh, you know, I, we needed a car to get around, because all these locations, whilst they're very close to each other, you need to, if you want to dot around them, uh, having a little car is really helpful. And so we drove down to a place called Trigolo. And this is where I was staying. And uh, we had a little water mill. So me and my friend, Ethne, we stayed in this water mill, stunning little uh, little place, which was surrounded by mosquitoes. But uh, it was a great little sort of hub. And then just a bike ride away, my other friends were staying in Fiesco. And Fiesco had this uh, strangely beautiful sort of mansion that they found on Airbnb. And very cheap as well. It was, really wasn't expensive. And this was just 20 minutes away from a place called Crema. And Crema is really the heart of where the movie takes place and Crema and its surrounding areas. So the villa they stay in in the film, uh, the square you see them in at the beginning of the film, the secret place. There's so many places and we'll talk about those. But uh, Crema is the hub, is the heart. And the house that they stay in Mm. in Crema, are you able to go see that? Can you go inside? What's What's the situation? Well, actually, with we it? took a took a little trip to that place, which is about twenty minutes outside of Crema, and uh, I, I remember this vividly because we were in the car, we were listening to the soundtrack of "Call Me by Your Name." We had the windows down. It was my friend Artem, Florin, and I, and it was just a real moment listening to the mystery of love and the Painted piano. Such a beautiful picture. Uh, here. It was just uh, I really remember it because I just I felt like for a moment I was in the film, and it was just uh-huh. you know just driving off to this. Uh, this real villa, which I think when I last checked was available for 8 million euros if you wow. want to buy it. We couldn't go in. It was completely blocked off. But you could peek through the gates. You could see where the romance started, you know. Um, could you see the pool? The pool, no, sadly not, uh, because the pool doesn't exist. Uh, oh. um, so that was uh, unfortunate because I, I I it would have been lovely to have gone for a swim. Yeah, so it was very much being in the surrounding sort of perimeter of this villa, but stunning. Uh, to see what I saw, it, was, it looks like it's, it was, you know, real and untouched. Okay, and then you sort of said that there were many different places to visit mm. around Crema, pretty much 360 degrees, and you were staying in Fiesco. Yeah. Um, there's also a secret place in the film, there right? There is, yeah. On this amazing list of locations, I, I found the bit where Elio and Oliver are talking when they first go to Elio's secret place, as he calls it, where he goes and reads his books and etc. So I took my little smart car with my, <laughs> bless her, my friend Ethne, and she, she won't mind me saying that she's lovely and she's, she's just turned 70. And, you know, I dragged her into this, the middle of nowhere. I mean, she, she wasn't particularly happy to be dragged everywhere. So we went, uh, you know, I said, it must be around here somewhere. So we found this road, this dirt track, as it were. We drove down it. So there were no um, signs, obviously, nothing, no, no help for you oh, to no, find this, this secret place. This is an untouched part of Italy. It re- you know, the, the film set in the 80s. This could have been the 80s. And that's what kind of added to the magic. So I drove down. Thank, I'm really glad, actually, I took a smart car. Because if I had a, a normal sized car, it, this would have been impossible. Wow. So we drove down. I mean, you could have walked or biked, but if you didn't know where you were going, it could have taken hours. So we stopped off and took a leap of faith and then walked about 10 more minutes. And I found this little pathway. And it turns out this the secret place is part of this nature reserve. 
and we stepped down and there was not a soul in sight and walked down to the water there's a little step you see in the film where wow Oliver, so you found you were certainly exactly. sure that it was and the secret and when Oliver play. he jumps into the water and you know following Elio and says it's freezing you know it, that is a true reaction you know it was so so cold and I think I'm pretty sure I could be wrong you could be correct but I'm pretty sure Army Hammer actually described that in a Q&A that he didn't realize it would be so cold so that's actually his real reaction rather he wasn't acting he was just uh, you know responding to how cold it was and it was so cold so were there other people in the secret place eventually a couple there? a couple turned up I, I, it's, it's a pretty romantic place so I saw a couple of uh, couples and different people turn up but you know in total at any one time there were probably four or five of us there and if you go around the secret place, you can see that moment where Oliver and Elliot first kiss. And when they're lying there, you know, it feels like you're in the middle of nowhere. And you can see, I mean, being gay in the 80s, you can see why they would have gone there, you know, uh, and how that romance played out. And, it, you know, I mean, even then in that in that scene, it's, it's not uh, Oliver's obviously struggling. So it, it's an amazing sort of secret place. And just remind me, so how did you actually even know where to go? Did you have the coordinates or did someone sort of mention that? So basically with, I mean, with Google Maps, and there was a longitude and latitude on this document. So I clicked it and it gave you a little pin. Even with this pin, you only had the sort of satellite image of where, and you could tell just about there's a pool of water and, you know, you'd expect there to be the, the secret place. But you still have to take a bit of a leap of faith and hope, you know, this would lead you to the right place. And there's a bit of exploring needed. It's not a, a definitive a sort of, it's definitely going to be there. It's sort of, you need to look around a little. Wow. It just sounds absolutely romantic. Talking about it, I just want to go back now. It's fantastic. Uh, it's just, it's, oh, the weather as well. I mean, that's an interesting talking point. Oh, yeah. um, what time did you go, actually? We were there, actually, year? it was ex exactly a year ago. So it was, uh, I was there this time last year. And it was July, so the begin, end of June, early July which is a really great time to be there if you want some heat. And I think similar time to when the film was set because it's the summer of, yeah, of um, that year. Probably and in winter it wouldn't be as I think they special. get. I think they get, like in the film, they get the snow and they get, you know, the, the, the extremes of weather. But there are still extremes in the summer. So every day was beautiful, clear sun. But then in the evenings you would have these amazing thunderstorms. Wow. And which really reminded me of that scene, you know, where Elie is lying on his mother. She's reading this book in German, in multiple, actually, reads, starts in Italian, moves into German and into English. And which is, I love this sort of transition through the languages and talks about this night and is it better to speak or to die? And he's, you know, lying there, unable to share those feelings with uh, someone else, or at least he thinks he wouldn't be able to. And of course, we find out later that he does. But, um, it, it, that really felt like that, you know, when the thunderstorms were coming, crashing down upon us uh, every night. But then it was just amazing to wake up the following morning and they'd be gone. So you can sort of say that you really felt the mood of the film yeah. by being there and the weather totally. actually played a part for you as yeah. well. Yeah, and uh, enhanced it. You know, you wouldn't normally necessarily say a thunderstorm enhances your experience, but in this case, it really added to the, the film experience. Well, I definitely think if you are going to a location because of something that you've seen, you do have to think a little bit about yeah. when is going to best replicate something. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, if you feel like the weather is moody and, and playing a part yeah. in that, it probably helps to how you're absorbing mm. and, and feeling that place, right? Yeah, yeah. And it did. And uh, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I'm a suck of a heat. I love, you know, warm weather. And I, I plan to find some more of that this year. But uh, um, it, it was very hot. So, you know... Not for the faint-hearted, but it was it was it was wonderful. Now you, because you were on the, how long were you there for in just total? Just a week, just, just one week. A week. Yeah. So it is possible to do all of this in seven so, days. I mean, you could do it in three days if, if you did a long weekend. You know, you could, if if you, if you start mapping it out in advance and you know where you want to go. And actually, to be honest, even though I had these ideas of where I wanted to go, there was still a lot of time to relax and just enjoy being in Italy and then we would just spontaneously go off to we'd, we'd just pick one from the list and say right should we go to the secret place should we go to the war monument should we go you know um to the river you got quite creative in fact didn't you I believe uh well the reference to peaches <laughs> well uh, the, the peaches sadly unable to uh, <laughs> there were no real peach trees around in this part of Italy so that's a a fun fact I guess you know the the part of Italy that the book is set in is more prone to there being peach trees and this scene we has become infamous of you know enjoying the peach <laughs> uh, I was unable to recreate that <laughs> <laughs> No, that's not what I was referring <laughs> no, I, to. <laughs> um, but uh, no, the, uh, th there, were, there weren't many peaches, sadly, in, um, in this part of northern Italy. But one thing I did recreate was th 
this uh, scene, I mean, Kremer, in the heart of Kremer, in the town centre, you have this beautiful square. And on the way, and, uh, you know, there's a scene where Oliver and Elio first go and have a coffee together or drink. Uh, it's a strange sort of blue liquid that Elio drinks. Anyway, I had this in my mind and I had what he was wearing in my mind. I thought I could, you know, I could recreate that. So on the way, uh, Stansted Airport, I went into Lacoste and got this... Uh, the thing I'm wearing now, this T-shirt. I can see it on you, yes. <laughs> um, and thought, that's the colour. I'm gonna, I've got the jeans, the shorts. I'm going to wear that outfit and we're going to go to Kremer and take that picture. And we did. And so we got into the Kremer town centre and there was the, the table and chairs. They've kept them there for a sort of tourism point of view. But no one was sat on them and it was, you know, the square was empty because it's sort of an untouched part of Italy. So I went and sat there and got the, the snap and recreated that. I had the Kremer tourism board Instagramming me. And, you know. Oh, amazing. We'll have to show you that photo, actually, um, and <laughs> use that maybe for our podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, please. I, I remember, actually, when I, I put it on my dating profile just for fun, and someone confused me for Timothy Chalamet <gasps> once. Amazing. Um, this guy. But, but I, there is I, the I resemblance <laughs> when you showed me the photo of him and, and you sitting there was quite uncanny, actually. <laughs> well, I tried hard. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> big fan, big fan. <laughs> so a few sort of logistical questions. You mentioned mm. you got around with a smart car. I mean, for yeah, people sure. that might want to emulate some of this at home, just how much does it cost to hire a car like I that? I think the car, I mean, I was sharing the cost with uh, one of my friends, but it was it was something in the region of like 150 quid for the, the whole week. It was really not expensive. That's not bad. And how about driving in Italy? Drive, oh, I, love, I mean, actually, it's my first time driving on the wrong side of the road for us. I'm in the UK, and uh, that was great. I got lost a few times, which to, to my friends to spare. Um, but you will. And actually, getting lost is part of the fun. Yeah. Um, I loved getting lost and stopping off at some random coffee shop we found or a bar. So, But the, I loved having the little car. I think you could have gone for a bigger, you know, bigger vehicle but actually having the little car really helped with this it's very experience. Italian isn't it and it felt very Italian exactly not so good when I drove to Verona because the, the motorways and you're in a oh. smart car and you're going fast it does feel a slight you know slightly uh, windy well that's a good tip then if you are trying to do a larger road trip in Italy yeah, probably sure. don't go for the small car but yeah. this is perfect to just do the getting around Cremo locally and, uh, yeah absolutely absolutely okay and you mentioned where you stayed. So mm. you were saying, sorry, in Trigolo or Fiesco? So I was staying in Trigolo in this little watermill. But literally, Trigolo and Fiesco are minutes apart by bike. And of course, biking in Call Me By Your Name is one of the, the key experiences. So that was really nice. Did you do any bike riding? Lots of cycling. <laughs> Particularly at the end, actually, I went off with Florin. Um, we just went for a nice cycle down the pass and just really you know, recreated that. Can and you it, rent bikes there then? I, I you couldn't, but everywhere where we stayed, there were cycles. So they had a shared in their, their Airbnb, which was full of old bikes. But they were really old, rusty bikes. And the same in uh, the watermill in Trigolo. But we, it was brilliant if, of an evening because where they were staying in this mansion was just a, either a walk or a bike ride away. So, you know, you, could, you didn't need to drive between the two properties where we were staying. And there were about six of us. So it was a really nice sort of way of enjoying the evening. You didn't need to worry about driving. And if, if, you and were, if you're having a drink. And stuff exactly. Like. Yeah. It's, it, which is really nice. So you mentioned the mansion from Airbnb. So yeah. just to understand, you yeah. obviously selected uh, a place to stay that was quite close to the areas that you wanted to go. Yeah. And you found what this, what does a so mansion look they like? They found, so I think there's an article and I, I, I will find the article, but it's online, which lists some Airbnbs that look like or are similar to the mansion in Call Me By Your Name. And this was one of them. And uh, so my friends booked that. There was sad, even though it was huge, and there probably would have been space if we wanted to, you know, sneak in on the sofa or go into the loft. We didn't stay there. So that's why the two of us, including myself, went off to this little watermill in, in Trigolo. But an amazing, this property was just huge. And, and sort of, again, like walking into a museum, it was untouched, you know, no Wi-Fi or anything like that. It was just, you know, a, a, a retreat. And that's kind of why you get away sometimes. It's mm. not to be super connected, but to really totally. connect with nature. Yeah. And if, if you're wanting to connect with nature or relive an experience from a film, then especially if that film is set in the 80s, then not having Wi-Fi is a really good thing. But really helpful to have if you need to find the location where you want to visit. Get your, you know, I, that was a, a useful tip as well is to have a smartphone with data. Yeah. If you, having a map, I mean, I would, I would not have been able to do the same thing looking on a, a normal map. It would have taken... 
That's months, true. <laughs> weeks. I, I know what you mean because I started traveling before Google Maps and when you yeah. used to have offline maps and there was some sort of beauty about going to yeah. a place before it's been discovered. I mean, totally. actually we, we could compare what you're doing to the beach. Now, yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio obviously mm. was in the film, but it was a book before it was a film. And then it was right at the time I think backpacking was becoming very, yeah. very popular. I would say it's early 2000s and certainly I grew up in Australia yeah. and – we're very connected to Asia. And I watched the beach and I thought, wow, yeah, I want to exactly. find that place. And Absolutely. sure enough, I actually did. You know, it's a well-known place now, but I went very early on and I have found a subsequent place that's in Tonsai, if anyone knows mm. their islands around Thailand. But Tonsai is a very special place to me because it has this element of the beach. But the yeah. actual place that people say where they filmed it is now sadly unable to be visited for the next two years. They've, They've closed it, it yeah. down mm. because tourists kind of overran it in order to see and get that classic Instagram shot of the beach location. And yeah. I think we both agree that's not what we want to have happen with the Call Me By Your Name. Yeah, and you're right, though. But I did exactly the same thing with Call Me By Your Name. You know, the lake that they visit several times in the film, there is this lake. And the research we did very quickly told us that this was off limits. But of course, that didn't stop us. So we went to find it. And we discovered, you know, there were lots of native Italians just enjoying this lake as well as us. But again, it's in the middle of nowhere. You can find it, the, the lake that Elio and Oliver swim in. But I, I fear, yes, of course, if we all went and did that, it would it will end up in the same scenario as the beach. Totally. But it's, it's a tricky one because we yeah. sit here discussing it. You've been, I can't wait to go. <laughs> and we feel like it's a right. But, yeah. you know, why is it okay for us to go but not everyone to go? So I think it's the way they, I mean, I don't know how, I, certainly when I went, which was a year after, almost a year after the film was released, it felt like no one was doing what we were doing. So maybe the the impact the beach had had a different impact on audiences and turning I mean the beach is particularly spectacular if you, from the film I love that that scene but the lake is I mean having swam in the lake now I mean it was just magical and I think back to that moment last year and it was the highlight of the trip in a way was being in that water and enjoying that moment so yeah I want everyone to do it in a way but of course yeah sustain, sustaining that how would they sustain that I don't know it's tricky and maybe because it's harder to get to your destination mm. it, we will see that not so many people yeah there's no parking it. I mean you uh, we left the car again I kept leaving my smart car on the side of the road probably not meant to do that but uh, it, it you know that helped us you know because we went off and enjoyed these these little secret places and you're kindly going to um, write a little bit about this for traveltalk.co. Yeah, yeah. So while we're not going to give away all the secrets, no, no, um, no. we will help yourself, you, yeah. <laughs> which will be fun. And just to wrap it up, um, mm. so how how much did the trip actually cost you? I, I think probably in the region of about 500 for the week, which is really good, I think. because I mean, obviously, there might have been more expenditure from food and drink, etc. But in terms of the travel and the, the flights and where we stayed I think it was it wasn't it wasn't in excess of that so it's pretty accessible in terms of a week in a beautiful part of Italy yeah it sounds very reasonable and, and that was another to... thing is staying with I mean it was a group of friends that I hadn't traveled with together in the same way I'd visited them all in different parts of the world but we all came together in this part of Italy and that was a magical experience spending time with people in that way so that was a top tip as well go away with a, an amazing group of friends or people that you really want to spend time with because it, it makes all the difference it does and actually you told me before though that mm. you didn't really know them all yeah that's true before you went so I knew that I'd, I'd visited um, some of them in Luxembourg and I knew um, one of my friends here from London but I remember from that Luxembourg trip that they were wonderful. So there was a sort of, I had some understanding of what it would be like to travel with them in Italy. But uh, yeah, there is always a leap of faith, I think. But it can be a, a great bonding experience oh, when you totally. are kind of in a place away yeah. from Wi-Fi, yeah. connected via something that both or means something to all yeah, of you. That, yeah. There's something special in that, mm, isn't there? Totally, totally. And so just to confirm, you flew into Milan and out of Milan, Milan right? Bur Yeah, both times. Yeah, Milan, Bergamo. Yeah. Okay, so, well, there you go. You've got a little <laughs> bit of information if you're listening, if, if this appeals to you. I certainly feel like I was transported to the place that Mitch <laughs> went and can't wait to check it out myself. I want to go back now myself. I think a <laughs> spontaneous flight might be in order. Well, it might be nice to go back over the years mm. and see how your relationship with that yeah. place changes. That's something I like to do when I find a place like this yeah. beach that I mentioned in Thailand. I've been over there at different stages of my life, okay, you know, 2007. Yeah. Then I went back in 2014 and then I went back in 2016. Yeah. And each time oh, the place great. changed yeah. quite dramatically. And I changed as I had gone through life. Mm. So maybe you'll find yourself going back to I this I mean, I place. would love to go back 
with a romance. Yeah. <laughs> that would be, you know, because it's recreated that way, of course. But that, yeah, I think going back is a really nice idea, actually, over a period of years. And of course, with the, uh, the sequel, right. Call Me By Your Name, Fi- I think it's called Find Me. It's coming out in October. That's the book. So the book, again, may be different to the film. Who knows? Uh-huh. But there will be a sequel in terms of the film. Well, they've already announced they'll do the film too. But that's the next trip, I think. <laughs> well, very much so. But the book itself is over, yeah. kind of covers a period of time, doesn't yeah. it, between two people and how they grew up totally. and the relationship they had to this place. And so mm. maybe that will be something that you can share with it as you go yeah. back and, and feel like you've gone over yeah. the years and seen yourself evolve as well as that place. Uh, hopefully. I'd love to, certainly. So, Mitch, thanks so much for joining us. We really look forward to reading your post on TravelTalk.co about Call Me By Your Name. We'll have that up in the next couple of weeks. It was really nice of you to share the Call Me By Your Name tour with our audience. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Travel Talk, the app to help you meet like-minded travellers nearby. Search for Travel Talk on the App Store. That's Travel Talk without the E. Go your own way. Thanks for listening to Travel Talking this week. We'll catch you in a couple of weeks' time and don't forget to download our app.